All right, Robert, you let me know, brother. All right, everybody, well, well welcome to, to uh, uh, the chat channel tonight. Thank you for hanging Emilio Ramos, and this is Red Grace Media. And tonight we're doing a conversation with Cy Timbrugan Kate. We're going to be talking to Cy about his new film, uh, Debating De La Hanti, and uh, I want to get into that. But really quick, I just want to introduce Red Grace Media and Red Grace Radio and talk to you guys a little bit about what we have going on. Uh, Red Grace Media is a blog, a website that exists uh, to talk about everything evangelical, evangelistic, and reformed. And all those perspectives tied in together, and so we basically get to talk about the things that we love. And I want to make you guys aware of some conferences that we got coming up. Uh, we have two conferences that we want to be looking out for. Uh, we've got one in May uh, called the Truth and Love Conference with James White and Tom Pennington, uh, and that's going to be at our church, Heritage Grace Community Church. And also in October, uh, we are doing our Emmaus a conference and the Emmaus conference is a conference that is devoted to a uh, a Christocentric uh, uh, a preaching of Scripture, a theology, a Christ-centered theology of the Old Testament, especially. And this year we're going to be focusing on Exodus. So we're really excited about those kinds of things. But you know, we really want to talk about what we're doing tonight. And tonight, this is one of our first uh, video. Um, uh, shows that we're going to be doing and we're going to be looking to do more of these Google Hangouts where we're going to be talking with folks like Cy Timbrugan Kate well not maybe not like Cy there's nobody like Cy so maybe not people like Cy but we'll be talking to other folks that are willing to come on and talk to us about all sorts of different things from theology to what's going on in the evangelical church to apologetics and evangelism the things that are near and dear to our hearts now I want to bring uh, our guest on. I want to bring Sai, and I think I want to begin by talking to Sai about how we met, because that was an interesting meeting, and we have a, an interesting story to tell. I don't know, Sai, you're going to have to help me out, but first I want to say welcome to the program. Hey, thanks so much uh, for having me, Emilio. I don't know if many of your um, viewers know this, but your book, Convert, if you look at the endorsements, Emilio was kind enough to allow me to give an endorsement for his book, so I really appreciate that. And he's a dear brother. And the incident that we're going to talk about where we met in Kentucky, of the group of us, Emilio was the one with the coolest head. And, and I don't mean look-wise, he maintained the, the most composure. And to this day, when I, recall, when I recount that story to my friends, I always tell them how calm and collected Emilio was. He was the voice of reason during this crazy debacle. And enough time has passed now that I, I think we can give more details than we have in the past, but you and I got to witness firsthand a Navy SEAL in action. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We <laughs> did get to witness a Navy SEAL in action, and I was going to title this little story um, uh, Evangelism, uh, a Navy SEAL, an ID and a headlock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... I'm glad that you're willing to go into detail because I wasn't going to. Chad's a friend. Of... Oop, I guess we're going to mention the name now. Too. Yeah, that's right. Chad Williams is a friend of mine, and I think he'll probably get a chuckle out of this, but uh, that was quite the incident. It was at the, after the Deeper Conference that was in Covington. Covington, was it? That's in Ohio, isn't it? I think so. It was, it was... It was right on the border, Cincinnati, Ohio. Covington's in Kentucky, that's right, and that's across right. the we... river, Cincinnati. That's they right. had that quite that festival afterwards, and, uh, and you know, I'll let you say what you want to tell us about about that. There, that's we met at that conference, and well, I think some of the speaking too, like even the conversation before that incident, you know, we got to talk about some of the speaking that was going on there and shared our thoughts there. And I already really respect you for your forthrightness. What we basically agreed on what what was being said, and then the incident happened. <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday. So if you're rough on any so, of the details, I'll help well, you. Well, let me. Yeah, let me just tell folks what we're talking about so they don't feel left out. But uh, <laughs> basically, uh, Chad was preaching on a on a bench out in Cincinnati. There's a big uh, heart a festival going on, and we were doing evangelism. We we were doing evangelism. I mean, everybody <laughs> there was drunk. Let's just right. I mean, that's but pretty not, much not what us. Going on. Just, just to clarify, not us, not everybody. Not us, not us. Uh, uh, but everyone around us seemed to be in a drunken stupor. 
At some point, uh, Chad Williams had his Navy SEAL ID stolen. Okay, well, and, let me let me explain exactly how that happened. Okay, yeah. Because I know that I know the story behind that. He was okay. preaching, right? And he was talking, uh, recounting a an incident of him being, uh, you know, a, a Navy SEAL incident, as he likes to incorporate in his preaching, you know, beautiful testimony. Yep. And there's a guy in the crowd was saying that guy's no Navy SEAL. He's lying. He's not big enough to be a Navy SEAL. So um, one other fellow, I don't know if we'll mention his name, good friend of both of ours as well, he went up to Chad. He said, Chad, give me your wallet. Now, Chad, he was up there preaching for a while, so he figured that this other fellow was going to go and buy him a drink. But he wasn't doing that. He was actually taking out his Navy SEAL ID to prove to this atheist or to this fellow that Chad was, in fact, a Navy SEAL. So he pulled out his ID, and this guy snatched it from his hand, and he turned to try and take a picture of it. So that's that's when the melee ensued. <laughs> it did because I don't know what you saw, Sai, but I saw a blur. <laughs> and in about 1.2 seconds, I saw a Navy SEAL travel about 50 feet and put a guy in a headlock and retrieve his ID. <laughs> right, okay. I'm going to fill in some more details. Then, cause like I said, I <laughs> okay, like go ahead. Hey, go ahead. So, Chad's here preaching, not aware of what's going on. Well, I'm sure he is aware, you know, in the corner of his eye. Three of the other evangelists get on this guy to try and get Chad's ID back. And they're not having any success. This guy, he's struggling. And then the fellow, his associate from Living Waters, yells out, Chad. Now, you talk about a blur, and I, no word of a lie, it's the fastest I've ever seen a man move in my life. Since then... <laughs> You know, before then or since then, I've never seen a man move so fast in my entire life. And there were three guys, pretty big guys, trying to get this ID back, and they weren't having any success. Within seconds, this guy was holding out the ID, and he'd go, take it, take it, take it, because Chad had this guy in a hold, and he had him in a hold with one hand, and with his other hand, he was waiting for this guy's friend to show up so that he could take care of them too. And I tell you, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And this guy, you know, we end up talking with this guy and, uh, you know, we apologize for... It, the incident should never have happened. Like, you know, we both, you know, we admit well, that. But the saint his head there was you. Now, because you were well, saying it was a disgraceful... You no, know, you were saying it was a disgraceful display. I still think that we were well within our rights, uh, you know, even legally with... It, but it yeah, should never oh, yeah. have happened. Yeah, I didn't and I do really respected well. how, how you talked about that afterwards, but it was just really cool to see. I mean... Pardon yeah, me. that's right. Cool. Yeah, that's right. And uh, let me let me just give the funniest, probably the funniest part of the story, Sai, that I, I never communicated to you or, or really anybody else. But after that was all over, the guy that was in the headlock came up to me just to give people an idea of how drunk this guy was. He grabbed me and said, "Why did you do that to me, man?" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, didn't, I, I remember him saying that, but I didn't realize he'd said it to you. That's pretty cool. That's funny. <laughs> so, anyway, um, great times I the today. Uh, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Good times doing evangelism, and that's you know what, Sai. That's that's one of the things I really appreciate about you uh, when it comes to apologetics and doing what you do is that you don't just talk the talk. You're not a you're not just a scholar in an ivory tower somewhere footnoting your life away. Uh, you're actually on the ground. You're going to the college campuses. You're in the universities. You're talking to real people. You're talking to real uh, students that, you know, young people at colleges and everywhere else. And to me, I mean, that makes all the difference in the world because I don't know what it was. It was definitely under the influence of Ray Comfort. But many, many years ago, I had made a decision for myself that I was going to make a commitment to evangelism very early on in my ministry and that no matter how busy I got as a pastor I would never stop going out and intentionally reaching out to the lost and so I just want to commend you brother encourage you and affirm you that you're the real deal you you go out there and you put your you put your apologetics to practice so God bless you for that well, praise God for that, brother, and uh, the atheists love it when I admit it, but I tell people I'm just a tool. And uh, it's interesting that you said you're not just a scholar in an ivory tower. The fact is, I'm not a scholar. <laughs> I've never been in an ivory tower. I quit my job as in a, in a, in a, I worked in a boiler room. I a stationary engineer by trade is what they call the trade. And I left that because I saw a need that Christians were communicating with unbelievers, and they're doing it in a way 
that not intentionally dishonest, but they weren't representing the God that I adore accurately. And I thought that was a disservice not only to Christians uh, misrepresenting God, but it's a disservice to the unbeliever hearing about something that none of us believe, not even the person saying it. And that right. was the real motivation for me to get out in the street. And, and I love seeing you on the street as well. And, um, you know, this is where the apologetic has really taken hold because these are the people actually engaging unbelievers and getting terrible arguments shoved down their throat. So now we realize the power of the apologetic is in Scripture. And if people, you know, that's, this apologetic drives people back to Scripture. And, and once they know Scripture, they can be confident to go out and defend their faith. And that's what I tell people. There is no um, office of apologist in Scripture. Like, uh, there's no office of love your neighbor ist either. So for me to call myself an apologist is really absurd. We're all supposed to be able to do it. And we're all supposed to be able to do it because if you do it biblically, if you do it right, it's easy. We just have to know Scripture and confront the number with that. Well, before you get too far into what you do, um, let's let's um, let's segue into your film. Okay, this is a this is a film. I mean, this is a documentary. This is a production. Uh, it's not just it's not just the debate. It's a completely different thing. I mean, it's a totally different uh, 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 perspective on what happened in the Dillahanty debate. And um, talk a little bit about how this documentary developed. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because no matter how many times we post that this is a documentary about the debate, we get people commenting, wait a minute, this debate is ready for free online. You know, and this is not the debate. This is a documentary yeah. about the debate. That's but right. it's from the Crown Rights perspective. Uh, Marcus Pittman, he's a master with the camera. And not only that, he said in this uh, film he made me likable. So he's almost a miracle worker, uh, worker as well. <laughs> but the, the thing is, if you see the, uh, like the debate is going to be offered with the doc documentary as well because it's also done in Crown Rights quality. And I haven't even watched the debate through on YouTube. It's had over 230,000 views. But if you watch it, you can see the facial expressions. You cannot see the discomfort of uh, Matt Delahunty when some of these things are going on. And in our production, I mean, I think even without the documentary, which people will get, just seeing the debate from that perspective, it gives a whole new perspective on what happened there. And as far as the debate, yeah, Matt's been challenging me online for a, a couple of years, and I finally uh, consented uh, to debate him. And uh, last May 31st in Memphis, that's where it took place. So <clears throat> uh, I don't want you to give them everything that, you know, is going to be contained we're going to talk to different aspects of your of the of the documentary here, but um, why don't we start first, Sai? Because I know just from social media, there's a ton of people, including my mom, who is tuning in tonight. Oh wow! And, Hello. Uh, uh, Emilio's mom. Thank you for Emilio. I mean, <laughs> the, mothers, the mothers don't get the credit or the praise, but thank you for having Emilio and for raising him up how you did because he's a wonderful brother. Yeah, amen, amen. Um, but just for for you know to bring us back down to to sim simple uh, definitions and and so that everybody can understand and be be included in our conversation. We don't want to speak over or past people. So right. I want you, Sai, to give us what is essentially the argument that you're making. It's called presuppositionalism. It's called the transcendental argument of God. Uh, Scott Oliphant is now calling it you know, covenantal apologetics. So in a nutshell, sum it up for us, but I want you to kind of spice it up a little bit. Okay. Right. Don't just give us a textbook definition. Not a spice problem. It up, spice it up a little bit. If there's anywhere maybe that you differ from right. some of the other guys, like John Frame or mm -hmm. uh, Scott Oliphant or Bonson or Jason Lyle, um, obviously I think you'd be pretty much in, in, in agreement you with give the majority me in trouble. of all that. But uh, so give us a definition, but give us, but keep an eye on everyone else and anything that you want to distinguish yourself with. Sure. You want to get me in trouble? That's that's the thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now what it comes down see to how is, diplomatic you can be. I don't give a rip what people call it, and I I carry very little of people's criticism of what I do who are in the ivory tower, and I get that criticism because my response to them is if I'm doing it wrong show me how to do it right. And I'm not saying that I'm, uh, I'm beyond correction. I say, please do correct me. But instead of just telling me, why don't you show me? It doesn't even have to be you. Show me somebody do, doing it right. And I do get that kind of criticism. But as far as the apologetic goes, most of my life I would be called what is an evidentialist. If somebody said they didn't believe in God, 
I would give them evidence. Look at the complexity of the eye, look at this, look, you know, whatever. And it was after uh, listening to the Bonten Stein debate, which a lot of people are familiar with. You could get it on YouTube. And that is the start for a lot of people in what is called presuppositional apologetics. When I heard that debate, I did not know what hit me. But it was powerful. And I still get something out of it. I probably listened to it a hundred times. And I, and I really loved it. But this is the analogy that I give it to people. I say, where do you hear evidence most often in the secular world? You hear it in the court of law. Who do you give evidence to in court? You give evidence to the judge and the jury. So an unbeliever comes up to you and says they don't believe in God, and you give them evidence, who, is you, who are you saying is the judge and, and the jury? Them. And which position in that courtroom does God take? Not the judge's chair. We put him in the criminal's box. And that was my motivation to quit my job almost seven years ago now because people are putting the Lord of glory in the criminal's box. Now, because Christianity is true, it will have the best evidence. You can win that court case. You can acquit God. But I like how Tony Miano says it. You know, what a disgrace that is to do to entertain the unbeliever in their blasphemous courtroom and to put God on trial. So I don't do that. So the very basic way that I explain, first of all, Scripture says everyone knows that God exists. So to give evidence to them, to convince them that God exists, is to deny what Scripture says. But this is what I tell people. If you get a piece of evidence, a fossil, you put it between us, uh, be, between a believer and an unbeliever. The believer will look at that fossil and will conclude, oh, Noah's flood. The unbeliever will look at the very same fossil and say millions or billions of years. Now, why is that? Intellectual people on both sides, PhDs on both sides, look at the same evidence and they come to different conclusions. Why is that? Because they have different beliefs that they take to the evidence. So it makes no sense to examine evidence because we all have rescuing devices. Christians have rescuing devices, as do unbelievers. And you referenced Jason Lyle, and he talks about that wonderfully um, in his books. But we all have rescuing devices. So if something in that evidence seems to contradict what we believe, we're going to go back to our, our foundational beliefs. The foundational beliefs that we take to the evidence, those are what is, are known as our presuppositions. And I think it's too bad that they use such big words to describe this apologetic. But this is presuppositional apologetics. So rather than discussing the evidences, and we can discuss evidence, but we say all evidence points to God. We're saying that the very concept of examining that evidence, you cannot make sense of without God. Romans 11.36 says, From him, through him, and to him are all things. That includes our ability to examine evidence. So if, if we say, no, we're going to give that to the unbeliever, you can examine this evidence and try to conclude God. We're saying, guess what? Even if we win the argument, the unbeliever could say, God wasn't necessary for that argument. I say, that's not the God I believe in. The God I believe in, you cannot reason to. You, it, this is the, the line that I say, the God of Christianity is not a God that you reason to. He's a God that you can reason without. So God is necessary for a reason. He's necessary to examine evidence. And as uh, in the debating De La Hunt, you could see that's what I tried to expose. That without God, he couldn't even make sense of being in that debate. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's, that's good. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit more uh, as we go on about the, just the particularities of the argument itself. Sure. Uh, but I want to talk about the film for a second, too. I mean, right off the bat, there's kind of a, ch a claim and a counterclaim about how the whole thing got started. I mean, Matt insists that you sought him out. Who engaged who first? What, you, you included that in the film, so what, right. what really transpired there? Well, I had seen Matt online before because, you know, Atheists, they would bombard me with atheist information, and, and he's one of the more pr uh, prominent atheists. I was never interested in engaging him, and the, the thing is, his show was on Sunday evening, and, and in our church, we have a church service Sunday evening, and I was not interested in missing church to call him, so I, I had never planned on calling him. And then I would get emails every now and then from Christians who had watched his show and said, Sai, he's calling you out on his show. And that's one of the reasons that we included those clips, because... If people are going to make accusations as to who uh, in, who instigated this, I back it up with the evidence from his show. Now, of course, you know he has a show, so it's very easy to do. And you see my opening statement; I used a lot of the things that he had said. But you could see very clearly from the clips that I took from his show, he was the one that brought me up, and he was the one that kept challenging me on his show. And then at one point, I and it was actually just very recently, prior to the debate, that he did it again. And I said, "Okay, fine, let's do this." And this is all documented. But I don't really even care about the backroom stuff. You know, we got together, we did this debate, and um, who who instigated it is not really important to me. But I think in in the film you could see, you know, really how it did start. And and those shows, you know, they're, they're documented. People can go online, people can look at them and and see it for themselves. Maybe maybe just a follow up question then. Um, 
do you know is Matt or in, in, in his group of friends or whatever are they going to be putting out their own version of this anywhere? Well, the, the debate is actually online, and people remind me of this on Facebook or wherever. It's already online. Why do we have to buy this documentary? Right. 230,000 people have seen it online. Now, okay. they have no intention, as far as I'm aware of, of making anything with this. You know, it's, it's done. It's over. But one thing is very interesting. Though, four months after the debate, Matt Delahanty did a review series of this debate. And I haven't even watched his videos, but I think he's got four videos out there where he's reviewing every aspect of the debate. And the atheists uh, were bombarding me on Twitter, what do you think about this review? And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to compare it with the review that he's done of all his other debates. I said, wait a minute. He hasn't reviewed any of his other debates. So if you go into the comment section, which I don't advise because people hate me online, but you can see the atheists are claiming victory. And, and they're saying, you know, how, how badly I was creamed that I wasn't even the debate. And I say, well, why does Matt do a review of this debate four months later going through every point? Because I think of all the atheists involved with this debate, he might be the only one who recognized what really happened. First of all, he will not debate me again. And secondly, he went through every aspect of the debate to try and explain what was said there. And I think that's because he really knows how his worldview fared in the debate. Right, 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 right. I, I'll be just totally honest with you. And, you know, if Matt uh, sees this conversation here, um, I have to be quite frank when I saw um, when I saw the, the the film, I had a really hard time taking Matt serious because it was just so clear um, just the the dishonesty, the lies, the flat out lies. I mean, you documented in your clips that you were using during the moderated debate. you documented some of the inconsistencies. And even the, the the dishonest things that Matt was engaged in, and I had a hard time taking him serious. What that was very interesting about the debate too, and we got, I mean, they made a mockery out of it, but the fact that they did not want just a discussion—that's what I really, I didn't really want a formal debate. I'm not really interested in formal debates. I just want to have a discussion like he has in a show. And the reason that I never called into a show is because he hangs up on people all the time when things get rough. So I right. thought, I'm not going to do that. Let's have this discussion live with, with a moderator who would loosely moderate it. And they said, no, we want a, uh, we want a, a formal debate. And I thought it was the debate organizer that, want that wanted that. But during the debate, Matt confessed it was he that wanted that. So the debate organizer and Matt were actually making these plans without my knowledge of it. But the reason that the debate organizer said that they didn't want that kind of discussion is because then the bully could just take over and dominate such a discussion. And I said, wait a minute. Isn't that Matt's show? <laughs> you know, that's exactly what he does in the show. And he hangs up on people when it gets rough on them. And oh, I yeah. thought, and I would still agree to have that kind of discussion with Matt, but he yeah. won't engage me again. But you know, I, I would love to do it. And I'd be happy to do it. But we got into a little bit of that in the Q and A, and I think that was actually the most powerful part of the debate. You know, when we got into the the back and forth, where I think the wheels further fell off of his worldview. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It just really the emotion behind it, this all the vitriolic mocking, all that stuff, just so clear, so I mean, so apparent what he was doing, and really sad. I mean, ultimately, it's 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 kind of sad for two reasons. It's sad because of the state of his soul, obviously, but it's also sad because it 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 really it rips people off from what should be a substantive de debate not a take it personal and try to come back with a gotcha comment or something like that. It's really unfortunate that he has to stoop to that level. So, And I want to commend you uh, for being Christ-like, keeping your character, brother, keeping – you were the coolest head uh, in, the, <laughs> in that. I, I learned from – I'll tell from you that right now. I, I learned from a good brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's – uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you another question. Just kind of, these are all kind of insider questions right now. But like, you had another. It looks like you did another interview with the moderator afterwards, right. and, and I think Eric Hoban was part of that. Right. Um, is, is the content of that recorded somewhere? That's all online. Um, it is. Actually, I think in the film too, you could see the YouTube channel. It's from the Thinking Atheist. I've been on that Thinking Atheist show in the past, and David Smalley who hosts the Dogma Debate. I've been on his show before with Aaron Ra, who really can't stand me. But, um, yeah, if you go to the Thinking Atheist channel, you can actually see that full exchange, as you can also see the full debate. And um, so that, that is available. And what a lot of people might not be aware of, 
Um, actually, it's not on my current, but I'm on the process of moving my entire website over to uh, WordPress. But the uh, the sermon that is featured in the film, I, I've also included on my uh, on my YouTube channel, so people could see that as well. I got a cold, so uh, you know, uh, sorry, I have to go to my Kleenex every once in a while, but uh, I'm going to try and get through this anyway. So I'll go ahead. This is uh, this is all family here. Um, <laughs> Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the statements that Matt made right up right at, right out of the gate, right from the opening statements. I was amazed, and I think that you, Sai, you do one of the best jobs that I've ever seen in any evangelist apologist of pinpointing precisely when and how a person surrenders knowledge. Um, he did that right at the opening gate. Can you do you remember that? Well, absolutely. The, the thing is, he did it before the debate. And that's what I was trying to expose in the clips that he had no business being there because he had surrendered knowledge. He, he'd surrendered truth. And specifically, as far as his opening statement, I barely even listened to it. He rambled through it, and it really had nothing to do. I felt with the topic of the debate. Certainly, his rebuttal didn't because he had prepared that ahead of time. So, you know, that's why I think my most uncomfortable thing was my rebuttal to his statements because I don't think that I had anything really to rebut. I was waiting for him to make sense of him even being there, and it never happened. So really, I think I should have been more consistent with my worldview and say, look, you haven't had, heard his justification for truth and just be quiet. But since I had 10 minutes, you know, I... I so for me, that was the most uncomfortable time. But, uh, oh, hang on a second. Something's happening with my camera. Can you still see me? Uh, something happened here. It kind of went dark on me. Um, I don't know. Okay, so I think we're still on. Okay, great. Oh, there you are. You're back. On, but some something happened there. Uh, yeah. So um, so yeah, the, the, I really enjoyed actually the interaction back and forth. But I, I don't know if you remember, uh, if you recall specifically when he gave that. I think that he gave that up in the opening. The very interesting thing is that a lot of the unbelievers accuse me of quote mining. Quote mining is taking a quote out of context and, and making it appear as though it's something that it's not. But the very interesting thing about that, during the entire debate, Matt never accused me of quote mining. He yeah. actually, when he went to give his opening statement, he was given 10 minutes, and you know the audience, of course, laughed. It was largely atheistic. But he said, didn't I already get 10 minutes? And he right. didn't say, wasn't I just misrepresented for the last 10 minutes? He said, didn't I get 10 minutes? So I think he stood by everything that he said, and he didn't think that any of it was out of context. So that that accusation is actually kind of odd, I think. I mean, I think it was, I think it was really clear why he couldn't do that. I mean, the clips that you were showing were so conclusive. I mean, they were so explicit. They were so obvious. Uh, his his contradictions and uh, his his double talk and his double speak. I mean, it was just so clear, especially when it came to the issue of uh, solipsism. I mean. I mean, as clear as crystal, um, half of the debate, he's denying the very thing that he admitted with solipsism. Isn't that right? I mean, isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's the belief that you cannot know anything outside of your own mind. And I said in the opening statement, too, that if that's the case, you can't even know things within your mind. You can't justify them. But he, he of course, mocked solipsism in one of his shows, and I showed the clip of that, and then he admitted to being a solipsist. And if, if that's the case, you know, all he was doing was sharing his faith claims. Mm. He was basically telling people what he believes. Now, I did not really uh, harp on the specific clips. We did that a little bit in the film. We brought up back some of these clips. But he said in those clips, it doesn't matter what you believe. You could believe that, you know, pink fairies fly out of your ear or whatever. I don't know what the clip was. And for the rest of the debate, he was saying, oh, I don't know that. I just believe it. So I, I hope that people go back and they, they think about those clips that I showed and compare them with the things that he said. Because he would deny knowledge. He says it's really irrelevant in this debate. I'm talking about beliefs. And he was the very person who said that the beliefs are irrelevant. It has to do right. with what comports to actual reality, which he could not justify in his worldview. Part of the film, uh, Sai, has you kind of, uh, it, it breaks off to a teaching that you're doing. You mentioned the church where you were at. Where, where was that, Tennessee? That was in Eads, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. Keith Blessings and Church. And his wife, and, Stephanie, a wonderful couple. They had me out the next day and really enjoyed that. Yeah, and I like the distinctions you were making there about evidentialism versus presuppositionalism. Um, we still, um, anytime I go out witnessing and doing evangelism, I'm still running into um, 
you know, Christians that are just so seeped in the evangelistic, or excuse me, the the evidentialist tradition, and and you you definitely uh, take issue with that in the film. You point out, well, you say that. That's my <laughs> Hold on a second. That's, uh, that's my pit bull, everybody. Don't, don't don't panic. That's Lily. She she likes to break in on the podcast from time to time. Uh, but let, let me try to come back to this. You you're talking about evidentialism, and you're talking about presuppositionalism. But there's a lot of folks out there. Um, I know early on I was also seeped in evidentialism. Gary Habermas. I was into Josh McDowell. I was into William Lane Craig. I was into all these guys early on in my, in my, uh, you know, my 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 Bible study. And um, doesn't the Bible though make what seems to be pretty clear statements about evidentialism? Can I read you something out of Scripture? Absolutely. So this is Acts chapter 17. Um, and again, I'm raising this only because in in the film you're teaching what to some folks might seem completely contrary to what Acts is saying. And I'm sure you're familiar with this passage, but Acts 17.30 says that God having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men everywhere that they should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof that all uh, to all men by raising him from the dead. So isn't Gary Habermas right? Um, first of all, um, Greg Bonton in his book Always Ready does a whole, in the appendix I believe, on Acts chapter 17 to show why it's presuppositional. Now I do not deny that there are evidences in Scripture. Jesus performed miracles, for instance, and we're talking about resurrection. And now I think these were, first of all, none of them were to prove that God exists. They were you know, what Jesus did, and they showed his deity. But this, if people want to use that, saying that that's evidence, you know, I will even concede that. I said, I don't mind that, but the evidence was miracles. I say, if you can do miracles, go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the kind of evidence. It's not talking about the complexity of the eye. And and people forget as well that the same um, Paul that, that, that went to Athens is the same Paul who wrote Romans, who says that people are without excuse for their sin against the God that they know exists. And this is the question that I ask people. If Paul never went to Athens, would the people of Athens have had an excuse when they died? Let's say Paul never went there. Now, right. according to Romans 1, we know that they're without excuse. Why are they without excuse? Because they know the God, and they're accountable to the God. You know, some people will, will misinterpret what I, you know, when we talk about uh, Romans 1, they say, oh, this shows that, that people really know that there's a God. No, they don't. They don't know that there's a God. They know the God. That's why they're without excuse. Because they were just some generic God. You can say, oh, I just picked the wrong one. Yeah, that's good. And I also think that in Acts 17, I mean, you know, it's very clear that the resurrection is not a brute fact, right? But I mean, in Christianity, the resurrection is actually a, a doctrine and a concept that only makes sense uh, with the biblical worldview. Right. One thing that is very interesting about that is the same Paul that was before Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 8. Now, what did Paul do to convince Agrippa of the resurrection? Did he say, well, you know, the Romans guard, guards, they would have been killed if that body was uh, stolen, you know, and that that stone was far too heavy to be, you know, moved just by these women, and that he didn't do that. What did Paul say to Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 8? He says, why do you find it incredible that God should raise the dead? See, that's presuppositional. He didn't try and prove the resurrection to him. And that's what I tell people. I say, I don't try and prove Noah's Ark to the unbeliever. I say, why do you find it incredible that God should build an ark? And one thing interesting about Acts 17, it talks about God forgave their ignorance. Now, I would like some people to explain to me how you could ignore something that you do not know is there. Hmm. To ignore something, ignorance, you can't ignore something if you don't know it's there. I think that's also culpable. And like I say, it's the same Paul from Romans 1 that says people are without excuse for their sin against the God they know. That's right. That's right. That's sort of what, what Bonson would talk about. Yeah, where... one, one thing I want to say too, though, is that you know we cannot forget that we're talking to ourselves, or myself anyways, 10 years ago. And one of my favorite uh, 
passages in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do we have that we've not been given? So mm. I have no problem speaking with an evidential. I mean, I think just like the whole Calvinist-Arminian debate, there's anti-Calvinist. Those people I can't talk to. I can talk to an Arminian. I can talk to a evidentialist and have a wonderful conversation. And I say to them, look, I don't even care about titles. If you can show me a way to present evidence that is God-glorifying, let me know, because that's my biggest concern. But uh, yeah. I can talk to an evidentialist, but I cannot talk to an anti-presuppositionist. Some people just hate the apologetic because it has its reformed roots. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So let's, uh, let's, let's transition into the section, because in the film... You, you captured the cross-examination. You remember that? Mm -hmm. So in the cross-examination, I mean, to me, it was, it was difficult to listen to what Matt was saying because he kept on doing things that were, well, I mean, they were absurd. Um, when you asked him how he knew anything, he asks you, what do you mean by no? Right. I mean... How do you debate somebody that comes to the table with that level of absurdity? That's right. He said the same thing about logic. What do you mean by logic? And I was willing to go with his definitions. What do you mean by no, you know, like when I ask how you know something, how do you know something according to your definitions? And one thing, you know, the people who haven't seen the, the film yet, because it's not out, <laughs> but I have shared it with a few people, is that in the film he claimed to only believe things, not know things, but we actually show clips in the uh, documentary where he says, I don't just think or believe this, I know it. So, mm -hmm. you know, outside of a debate setting, and like I say, if he meets a policeman on the street and he says, do you know how fast you're going or whatever, you don't say, what do you mean by no, officer? And and, and that's the thing. Away from this, when he talks to uh, his, his uh, group, when he talks to his group of unbelievers, he'll talk a certain way. But when he talks to Christians, he has to deny those terms because those terms expose the folly of his worldview. And um, I think that that's very uh, apparent here. Now, one thing that I might do, I, you know, I don't want to look um, like I'm antagonistic towards him, but he's still posting videos on his YouTube channel. And I feel like taking those clips where he makes knowledge claims, where he makes claims that he totally contradicted in the debate, putting them together and putting up some brief videos just as advertising for uh, this exchange just to, to show that you know, he only talks like this when he talks to a Christian, but when he talks to unbelievers that, you know, he talks like a Christian. He, he talks about absolute laws of logic. He talks about truth. He talks about knowledge. But he must deny this in a debate setting. And I think it looked foolish, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I mean, it, it does. It makes it very frustrated uh, or frustrating for us to watch it, to endure that kind of... And then to hear that people are suggesting that he actually accomplished something in the debate, right. that he actually... That he, you know, defeated you, that he... That he crushed you, that he's, you know, that he won, you know, far Matt's and away. I mean, that was that was Matt's difficult. His to followers, to. I, I want to key in on one one thing you said there before you go on about the frustration, because one thing that was really surprising to Matt, he says, I can see why you're frustrated. I said, I'm not frustrated. I can understand that the people watching might have been frustrated, but why was I not frustrated? When can Matt understand my argument? When can he understand this? Not until God saves him, right. because this is folly, the unbeliever. And to the degree that they do get the argument, they must suppress it in unrighteousness. Because if they understand it, you know, that would be the Holy Spirit guiding them to salvation. So I don't get frustrated when the unbeliever does it. Sometimes you think it's so obvious, how can you not get this? But they must suppress it, and they won't get it until God saves them. Amen. And I think that's what separates us as Reformed folks, is that we understand that salvation is in the Lord. We, we know the monergistic activity of God that has to happen in order for someone to come out of darkness into light. And so we can, in a sense, the Reformed apologist can rest and have total confidence that God is going to use his word the way that he sees fit. I mean, don't you, don't you feel that freedom? Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, um, when I go to speak in, in, in different places, I don't wear on my sleeve the fact that I, you know, I'm a Reformed apologist. You know, some people recognize that this is a Reformed apologist, but when I speak, I speak from the Reformed perspective, and I never get grief from Christians. Because really, deep down, we all believe the same thing. Is when you attach certain terms to them, you know, that's when people start to get upset. When you start, you know, naming names of people who, you know, who use this type of apology or the founders of, of this doctrine. But I think Deep down, all Christians believe the same thing. And that's why I get along with people from all these different camps. And people from all these camps are embracing the apologetic. I think 
sometimes the wheels, like this one debate recently, um, a fellow who was not reformed using the apologetic, and it went pretty well until they got into the topic of evil, and then the wheels fell off. Because if yeah. God is not sovereign over all things, and this apologetic makes no sense, and that's what we say from a non-reformed perspective, if man is not totally depraved, then you think that he has some vestige with which he can reason to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we say, no, that's not the case. They cannot do that. Because if a person was not totally depraved, it would make sense to give them evidence. Give them evidence such that they can come to this conclusion. But as a reformed people, we know that's not the case. So why do we still go out and debate people? Why do we still evangelize when God predestines everything, when he's in control of everything? And, and this is how I try to help my reformed brothers. I didn't want it to be a reformed podcast, but I say, look, does God know if you're going to have a full stomach tonight? And they say, yes, he does. I say, why do you eat? <laughs> if God knows you're going to have a full stomach. Because our eating is the means by which God fills our stomach. Or our maybe eating and our praying for people is the means by which he saves people. He condescends to use us worms in his plan. Praise God. What a wonderful God that is. He can save people miraculously. He can fill our stomachs miraculously. But by his grace, he uses people like you and me, brother, to save people. What a glorious God we serve. Amen. And I mean, I think sometimes the language, you know, that's used is, well, if God has ordained everything, why pray? Why evangelize? And mm -hmm. that's a, I, I'm going to have to use that, Cy. If, if they have a problem with prayer and God's decrees, then I'm, I'm going to ask them that question. Uh, you know, do you believe that God has ordained for you to eat tonight? Then why are you going to eat? <laughs> yeah, you have a full stomach, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing. The quote, I think people said, if God is sovereign, why pray? And the answer, if he's not, why pray? You know, why pray if God ha has no control over the situation, that he's already done all his work? And, and for me, and James White said something that's very interesting. He says that your theology drives your apologetic. And I fully understand where he was coming with that. I know he's a friend of yours. But for me, it was the exact opposite. The apologetic drove my theology. I grew up in a Reformed church. I should have understood Reformed theology, but I didn't. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would have given you non-Reformed answers. But it was the apologetic that helped me understand the sovereignty of God in all things, the authority of Scripture. So the apology, I am they're related. Just James White says that your, your theology drives your apology. I feel that they are perfectly related. But for That's me, right. it was the exact opposite. My understanding of this apologetic drove my theology. And, and it's just been very comforting in, in so many areas to know that God is in control. I mean, that's my favorite verse of Romans 8.28, that God works all things for the good of those who love him, even the times when we mess up. And that's comforting because, you know, hopefully that time that we mess up, we'll remember that when God puts the person in front of us that he's going to save by our words. That's one of the things I really like about you, Sai, is that you, <clears throat> you make everything immensely practical and... Um, I love that about you because uh, that's what people need. They need real life application, when, especially when we're dealing with such heady things. And these things that can get very heady. You read an apologetics book. I remember when I first read Van Til uh, as a young Christian, um, it was way over my head. And I, I would have loved to have met somebody like you who could just bring it down to a, a, a digestible level where I don't need to be a professional at epistemology in order to get a handle on how to defend my faith. And you know, I want to commend you for that, So I, I think right now, I know that you've, I know you've taken criticism by some folks by making the presuppositional argument more simple than it really is. But I am the complete opposite of opinion. I'm thankful that you make the argument. You pull the hay off the loft so the cows can get at it, so to speak. You make it palatable so that so that the stay-at-home mom at my church can grab the argument, use the argument, make sense of the argument, and they can share the argument, and they don't need to be, you know, they don't need to have a degree in in, in philosophy in order to defend the Christian faith, and I think that's the way it ought to be. Well, absolutely, because the thing is, these people who are very intellectual with this, I think that they see something like this, they see a factory work with a film on this apologetic, and I think in the back of their minds they're saying, if he's doing it right, we're not necessary. But that's not the case at all, because they must no. take these difficult no. concepts for people like us to dumb them down. 
Now, what I would really prefer is if these people see something that I'm doing on the street, I, I don't deny it. I'm a factory worker. I might be making a mistake with some of the things I say. I would love them to send me an email, put their arm around me, saw when you said this, maybe you should have said this instead. But I don't get that. I get the saw you're doing it wrong, saw you've made it too simple. I say, well, that's fine. Show me. I'm not beyond correction. My heart is for the lost. There's a fellow that I debated a, a while back, and um, that actually, that debate is in, in a, a book. It's in the portable presupposition. But this fellow... He, um, he contacted me and he said, I want you to do a critique of my critique of presuppositional apologetics. I want you to go through this essay I've written and criticize it. And I said, I don't give a rip about your critique of presuppositionalism. I care about your soul. I said, I'll come back on your podcast and I'll talk to you about that. But I don't care about that part of it. Now, if I make a mistake, I'm not beyond correction, but I'm all about reaching the lost. And, I'm, and the thing is, I want to say it in a way that's understandable to me. And that's one of the things that I tell people. I've been a Christian as long as I can remember. I'm not saying that I was born a Christian, but I, I tell people it's like having a puzzle dumped in front of you at a very young age. And in my family, we flattened all the pieces out. We turned them over, and we started with the border. And that's how we he did this. We do this puzzle. And and I tell people it's like I had this puzzle dumped in my in my lap at a very young age, and I turn these pieces over and I fit them in place. And when I come to an understanding, I want to share that with people, and I try and bring it down to the level that I can understand. And if I can understand it, then I think that most people out there can understand it. Because you could see the conversations that I have with people. A lot of the people I engage are way smarter than I am. I don't deny that Matt Dillahunty is way smarter than I am. But what you find with these conversations, even at the end of How to Answer the Fool, that the more intelligent the person is, it doesn't make their argument better. It just makes them better at hiding their folly under big words. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I would say it makes them look worse because it shows the futility of their worldview that no matter how 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 you want to dress it up no matter with no matter how you know elaborate and how sophisticated you want to make your language if at the end of the day a simple uh, a simple analysis or a simple critique of your worldview shows it to be completely inconsistent I mean that just makes the matter all the worse for the person espousing the worldview um, let me let me let me uh, let me ask you this question side because this is this is a question that that evangelists typically get on the streets at times when it seems like you're going in circles. And I thought that with Matt Dillahanty, there are times there. Have you ever struggled with, am I casting my pearls before swine? All the vitriolic language, all of the mocking, all of the silliness, all of the, 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 the dishonesty and all of that. Does it ever make you think like you're just, you're casting your pearls before swine at some point? Absolutely, and I think that we should be aware of that. But one thing, especially in this technological age, is that it's, you're not only dealing with the person you're talking to. Like I say, over 230,000 people now have seen that debate. So whereas I may have been casting pearls before swine with uh, Matt Delahunty, there might be that person in, you know, in, in Australia sitting somewhere you know, watching, it, watching this debate who actually gets something out of it. And even at the campuses as well, you see, you know, I, I uploaded a video recently from Temple University in a, in a very hostile crowd. But I think if you maintain your composure, then there will be some people who might never contact you, you know, who God is using that, uh, that with them. Now, the thing is, in the past as well, like when I was cutting my teeth on this apology, I would go through some threads for thousands and thousands of posts. And, you know, I, of course, I did care for the lost. In a way, it was also to hone my own skills because there's not one argument I don't think that I'll ever hear that I have not heard a variation of it by doing this online. Now, people contact me still and say, Sai, can you come into this forum? Every once in a while, I'll do that. But I do see the futility there, and you know, I, I like to help to train people in engaging the unbelievers. But I think a lot of times we go too far with that. And I think you'll also see an evolution um, of the way that I do the apologetic. If you look at some of my older videos, I talk about the preconditions of intelligibility. And I remember the very first time that I taught this, it was a church in uh, London, Ontario, um, the city pretty close to where I'm at, where I'm uh, from. And I was talking about the preconditions of intelligibility, that you know, logic is universal, abstract, and invariant, and the guys were loving it. They were writing notes, oh, what do I say here, what do I say here? And the women in the audience, their eyes were glazed over, and they were, oh, you know, I had to learn all those evidence, and now I have to learn the preconditions of intelligibility. <laughs> and it was the women in the audience that showed me that I was doing it wrong, mm. that this apologetic is not about the finer points of epistemology, it's about a relationship. And women are far more relational. I'll talk at a men's conference, and the, the men will go home and tell their wives, everyone knows that God exists. And the women will say, oh, I, I get it. This is easy. And the women women don't have to win that argument. They'll come up to somebody on the street, 
He says, I'm an atheist. Say, well, oh, no, you're not actually, sir. Well, yes, I am. Well, sir, you're not. I'm going to pray for you. You know, and go, The man has to win that argument. But the women will say what the truth of Scripture is because they're more relational, I think, and, and just were built differently. And I, you know, I love when people get the apologetic, but it's the women that help me to understand it better. It's not about the constituents of the art. It's nice to have that in your back pocket when you run to the philosophy student, but most of those people are not philosophy students. It's your aunt or your uncle or your mother. And you have, that's why we have to do with gentleness and respect because you're destroying worldviews. You go up to the person and say, look, I know that you know that God exists. And more often than not, I've had the person that I'm talking to break down in tears. Right, and, right. You know, and that's when you see the, the power of the biblical message. Now, of course, they might not do that, but knowing that they know, I think, is, is very important when you engage the unbeliever. Right, right, right. Well, so I, you know what? I wrote something here uh, as a summary. Um, there were so many other parts of the film that I liked, that I enjoyed. I don't want to give it all away um, because I want people to go and get this film and watch this film and love this film uh, because they will love it. Uh, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very, very well done. Uh, do you mind if I read something that I wrote about the film uh, in terms of a review? This is what I wrote, so I, I said, The Bible says that the apostles were to be a spectacle to all men. What size debate with Dillahanty will show is that no amount of philosophy, sophisticated sophistication, or diplomacy in comparative religion will remove what the Bible refers to as the foolishness of, pre of preaching in the eyes of a godless world. What size latest film project will show you is the transcendental nature of Christian truth, the arbitrary absurdity of non-Christian thought, the willful ignorance of those who reject the Christian message, the lamentable condition of the lost and the futility of their worldview. Atheism and agnosticism are seen for what they are, self-refuting, irrational, untenable worldviews which are rooted in a vicious circularity. And finally, what comes through with greatest resolution in size film is his compassion for the lost, Every self-proclaimed apologist and evangelist can take a page out of Cy Tim Bruggenkate's script for reaching the loss with a broken heart and with, and with a mind that is unflinching in its commitment to Scripture. I felt like I needed to write that and I felt like I needed to say that because what I loved about the film more than anything was its gospel-centeredness. It really ends on a very gospel-centered note, and that, I think, is what's going to make this film really shine. Well, pray, praise God for your kind words, brother. And uh, I mean, I was tearing up just listening to that. And I, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm six, two and a half, and you know, I don't really like to have my uh, emotion shown. And, and uh, that's why like, I was really exhausted from the preparation for this debate. I had a conference beforehand, and I preached a sermon, like I said, the next day at the church. And I did get emotional in the service. And one thing I said to Marcus uh, Pittman, the, the director of the film, I said, don't use that. Because I just didn't want it out there. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he closed the film with that. And That's I'm right. so thankful that Marcus didn't listen to me. That's right. I didn't want to give that part away, but <laughs> since you did. Okay, no, we won't talk about it. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that, that he did leave it in there, even though it did show some emotion. Like I said, Marcus said, I made you likable. But um, I do this because I have a passion for the lost. And I... I because people have seen How to Answer the Fool. They say, I've seen your film and I hated you. And really we made that film, I think, more for people, just our friends who, who know my heart. And I think that, uh, like as John Speed said, this is a, a perfect companion piece to How to Answer the Fool so that people can see the, the heart. Like Tony Miano had said that, he said, How to Answer the Fool really shows God's mind behind the apologetic. And the, this film shows God's heart behind the apologetic. And, I mean, we serve a wonderful God who, who saved us. It, apart from the grace of God, we're them. And we can never forget that. As ridiculous as their arguments are, and as foolish as they sound, apart from the grace of God, that's us. And mm -hmm. apart from the grace of God, spending an eternity in hell. And we can never forget that. So when we have been blessed with an apologetic, we have to praise God. And I tell people, when people understand this apologetic, it's not when they can win arguments. That's the consequence of it. I say, I see people understand this apologetic is when they love our Lord more. Because he has commanded us to defend our faith, He's also equipped us. How could we not but love him more? One of the reasons why I support you, Sai, so much in what you're doing is that even in the context of a formal debate, you do, you do not 
hesitate and you don't fail to preach the gospel. And I think that a lot of um, debates and apologists that I've seen over the years, they almost assume that they're not obligated to preach the simple gospel message of repentance and faith. You do that, you do it consistently, and that's one of the reasons why I so highly recommend what you've done here. It's a great example. It's what has to happen. And we pray that you'll never stop doing that, brother, regardless of what platform you ever get to, that you will always br bring it back to, well, what I tell college students all the time after having a sophisticated discussion with them about epistemology or something or history, I tell them, you know, at some point you have to humble yourself like a child. Isn't it amazing that the one who knew everything, who had all knowledge, says that he doesn't give you a stack of epistemology books. He tells you, you need to humble yourself like a child or you will by no means enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah, other than that, you know, we're just a clanging gong. It's just hot air. And that's the thing about the other apologetic methodologies. They don't lend themselves to a gospel presentation. And that's one thing that really hit me early on in my career doing this as well, is people say, well, how do you get from here to the gospel? And I realized that if anybody asks me that question, I'm doing it wrong. Wow. If you have to ask me the question, how do you get to the gospel from here? I'm, I failed. I said, this presuppositional apologetics is an exposition of the gospel. I'm showing that without Jesus Christ, you can't make sense of one thought in your head. I'm exposing the sinfulness. Part of the gospel is the sinfulness of man, and that's what this apologetic does. It exposes the sinfulness that they're not giving to gl glory to God for every thought in their head. So if you're not in the gospel presentation with, their, with this apologetic, you're doing it wrong. And you mentioned a bunch of names, and I realize that these people are academic, and I learn a lot from them. I would love to see these people on the street because a lot of the criticism that they might throw my way, I think they will they will just dissolve when they're out on the street engaging the unbelievers. That some things are great for head knowledge, but they're useless out on the street. We have to get to the heart of the unbelievers. That's you know, both of us have learned a lot from Ray Comfort, and our apologetic methodologies differ, but he has a, a love and a heart for the lost, and, and we can't forget that. And you know, hopefully that, like I say, hopefully that shows in that film, and I really appreciate your kind words about it, brother. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Sai. So talk to us a little bit about um, what's next for Sai, Tim Bruggen, Kate. We want to get that on. You got? Do you have a book coming out, Sai, or is it out? Do you have a book out? What's, what's You know, um, in, in, uh, in May, it'll be seven years that I left my job to write a book, and I haven't written a book. I, you know, one thing is really <laughs> terrible. When you leave your job to write a book, it's very terrible to discover that you're not an author. <laughs> and when you leave your job to go out and speaker, it's horrible when you find out you're not a speaker. But by the grace of God, he's uh, maintained me in this ministry for this time. And this year, I hope to have more time to actually write the book. But, you know, I, of course, you know, God, uh, he works all these things for his purpose. If I wrote this book when I got out, you know, six years ago, I probably would disagree with a lot of the stuff that was in it now. Because then I was into the, the meat of the argument rather into the relationship of the argument. Like, I'll go to a, a, a conference, and I'll say, you know what, I'm not going to teach you how to defend your faith in God today. I'm going to teach you how to defend your faith in your parents. And they look at me like I have two heads. And, you know, I say, that would be bizarre because you know your parents. So now I understand that teaching this apologetic is relational. I don't have to teach. Teaching apologetic is actually absurd because mm -hmm. we're supposed to be able to do it. That's why there's no office of apologists in Scripture. So... You know, I go to diff these different functions, and what I do is not, I don't really teach them apologetics. I strip away what the world has taught them. You know, the world wants us to get away from professing the certain God that we all know exists. And all I try to do, and I tried to do it, you know, is, is to get people back to understanding the God that saved them and talking about him. And that's why anybody could do this, and I'm glad to be used as a tool in this process. And uh, I've got a conference coming up in Arizona next week. I'm looking forward to that. I have uh, good friends are on both sides of this uh, debate. And that's one thing. Even in, in the topic of this conference, I would like to see more love among brothers, and I hope that that's going to be the case in Arizona next week. So. Yeah, amen. We can, we can always use more unity. I mean, with uh, Islam on the rise, doing what it's doing, with secularism out of control, with the homosexual liberalism and the agendas that are uh, all over our college campuses and universities. Uh, sadly, the last thing that we need is more division uh, in our ranks. And mm -hmm. so I, I hope that 
your conferences will produce uh, a greater level of unity among the brethren. That's that's a great that's a great way for us uh, to uh, to end our show. And uh, I got to tell you, Sai, it's been too long. We got to get together. We need to hit a university together. We got to go remember. out and uh, we got to reach souls for Christ. And I'd love to do that with you uh, sometime in the near future. We need we need to make that happen somehow. Well, I love you, brother, and it's, it's nice touching base with you again, and I thank you so much for having me on. Hold, hold on one second. What's that? Well, so, Sai, give us, uh, I'm just being reminded here, give us the information where everybody can find out everything about you, including and especially uh, where they can get this film. I'm so glad you brought that up because Marcus would have shot me. He's probably watching this right now. But <laughs> my website is proofthatgodexists.org. I'm moving it all over, and uh, I think through um, absoluteapologetics.com. But you can get the film at Debating Dillahunty. That's with two L's. DebatingDillahunty.com. You can get the film there. And um, it's going to be released on February 19th. Now, Mark came up with something yesterday. He says if we get 100 new pre-orders, that he'll release it as soon as we get 100. So, uh, you know, it could be released tonight if enough people pre-order. If not, then it'll yeah. be uh, February 19th at the conference that we're going to release it at debatingdillahunty.com. And I urge people to pray for Matt Dillahunty. Pray for the people in that audience because, uh, like I say, except for the grace of God, that's us. Yeah, amen, and, and uh, God has recently reminded our evangelism team uh, out of our church, recently reminded us of, of the power and the necessity to pray. Uh, we, we had a young college student that has been every week coming out with the most vile and the most hostile opposition, threatening to slice our throat, having the cops have to come out and pull him away. Uh, that that gentleman came up to me this past week, apologized, gave me a hug, and told me that he was sorry. We can never underestimate what God is going to do with anyone. We can never view anyone as beyond the reach of the sovereign grace of God. So I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, uh, Sai, that we need to keep praying for Matt, that the Lord would turn his heart. After all, his heart is in his hands and he can turn his heart just like he turns the hearts of the kings like the rivers of water. Uh, our God is sovereign and in control, and he can do that. So we got to pray that he will. we got to beseech him and come to the throne, and we need to ask on behalf of these, of these folks that they will get saved and come to know, come to know Jesus. But, brother, i got to tell you, I'm so blessed to have you. Um, it won't be the last time. We'll do it again. Um, I just I thank you again for being on, and uh, again, just for everybody, um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching uh, this program. Again, please uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can go to Twitter at Red Grace Media. You can go to Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Red Grace Media, and just go to our website, redgracemedia.com, and you can see uh, everything that we have going on there, all of our latest articles on theology, well, on everything, evangelical, evangelistic, and reformed. Cy Timbergen, Kate, is a great reminder. Brother, you are a great reminder and an example that we don't separate evangelistic from reformed. So thank you for being on uh, tonight, brother. God bless you. Amen, brother. Good night. Good night.